Uh, let's see. Today is on recording every class you teach. It's it's both a um, a push here locally at the um, at National Trail as well as something great to do for your students, both UDL wise uh, and just general instruction wise. And uh, that we're going to talk about basically why you should try to record it, how you record it, and what to do with those recordings today in this class. So, first of all, why we record the class. For any student that misses class, and that's really how I got started. Uh, seven years ago, I went to a class with uh, an instructor called, named Brett Ginsberg, and he said, if you can record your class every day for the student that's missing class, then students can always make up your class. Because if you're teaching something, and, and, and it's a key point in math, and they come in the next day and say, I missed class, Mr. Ritter, for what, what do we go over? Uh, okay, so everybody else stay here. I'm going to go over the 45 minutes that we spent yesterday. It's impossible to do. We cannot make up classes like that. We can say it was chapter 5, read it, but they don't get the instruction. Whereas if we record it, and in the, the case of what I do is I post it on my little calendar, then if they miss class, they can just go to that day, click on it, they get the entire class just like what I'm doing right now, right? They, they get the recording. Everything that you see on the board, they see, and every word that I say, they hear when, it, when I do a recording. So that's the first thing for, for the student missed classes. And I said physically or virtually because many times, especially in the high school, we have kids who didn't sleep last night, who stayed up all night, who have two jobs, and they come in and we're the whole time we're walking over here to Savannah Avenue trying to get her to wake up because she's <laughs> sleeping in class. Okay, so it's not just physically. Sometimes the students are phased out. Maybe their parents had a fight before they came to school. All they can think about is that. There are all kinds of reasons that students may be here physically but miss class totally uh, anyway. So uh, when Brett taught that class, he taught about teaching to the absent child. So act like somebody's not here and what I'm doing on the board and the way I'm talking to you is for the person who's not here at all because if she phased out and isn't here mentally, she's not here anyway, and how do they get that instruction? And one of the things he talked about was um, particularly in math class, that he had uh, a color chart on his board that, that said something like, you know, uh, black equals problem, red equals step one, blue, step two, and so on. So he switched colors as he did every math problem, which is easier to do with the, with the smart board than it is with the Mimeo. Smart board, all I have to do is pick up that pen and set it back down, and I'm now a color. The idea is that when kids watch the video or look at a PDF of the work, they automatically know that, well, that was the step one, and then the teacher did that, and then the teacher did that, and it kind of thing, for math problems in particular. I don't switch colors a lot when I'm just explaining something because I don't need to. I do switch them sometimes. The other thing is, uh, besides just missing classes, students that need remediation. There are lots of times that kids don't get what we said on day, on, on talk number one, and a math class is probably a prime example, that it might take them three or four extra problems for some students to understand the concept that our, our really smart student understood on the very first time with the problem. So we can use those for remediation, and in math classes, and any one that does a problem set in particular, talk about in first block, use a different example in second block. Use it because in at your point as a math teacher, <coughs> hopefully you could put a different math problem up and still solve it in front of the kids. But to the kids, it's a completely different problem. So if a child that had you first block, it's like I saw that problem. I didn't understand, Mrs. Rodefer. Well, watch second block, and then they watch the second. Now it's a whole other set of problems, and logically, you probably have four classes of the same class that that's four problem sets that a child that's needing remediation now can get four different sets of problems that they can look at if they need to. So um, it allows them to post it, see at their own pace. Parents can help them out if they see. There's a lot of parents that would help if they could, but they don't know what we're doing in the class, right? So especially in, in a middle school and elementary school math level, many teachers can handle that. I'm not saying that every teacher could watch Mr. Alexander's, or every parent to watch Mr. Alexander's calculus class and help. I had five calculus colleges in, or calculus classes in college. I guarantee you I probably could barely be able to help pre-calc at this point because it's 30 years ago, right? right? I mean, it's a, yeah. Um, so I already said this using different examples in every class. 
And then later on, we can use them for blended activities. When we did the blending learning initiative in the high school a few years back, the biggest thing people complained about is I can never find a video that goes over what I wanted. Okay? And you're probably a perfect example. There's probably very few videos talking about how to do steel drum or how to do some of the courses you teach. But if you record what you teach this year, next year you have a whole repository. And so if I'm going to miss class, I don't re-record a whole class. I go and look, this is, where, this is where we're at. When did I do this last year? And I look through my YouTube videos, and there it is. Okay, and I might tweak it or something, but now I don't have to do anything extra for the sub, and the class continues on because they just played the lecture that I did last year. And I truly believe it makes you a better teacher. If you know that your stuff is being uploaded and the parents can watch it, I think you try this much harder, just like you do when you know the principal's going to be in the room, try a little bit harder if you know another adult might monitor you. I, I, I truly believe that. Um, and I think that's good for you, right? So how to record the class. By the way, there's, there's multiple different ways, and this is the easiest way. Um, and the easiest way is to use the smart recorder, okay? Now, first of all, if you don't have a mic, you can't record. And if you don't have either one of these or one of them mounted to the ceiling, all you have to do is ask. Every classroom in the high school already has one mounted somewhere. Um, and we've changed them out some, like um, you may not downstairs. I don't know if there's one downstairs. But all you have to do is say, hey, I want to start recording. We'll put it in there. The way you want sound matters with what mic we give you. For instance, Dan Clark had one mounted, like most of the high school does, up above the projection surface in there. Uh, and he wants to be able to walk around the room and talk from anywhere. So we took that one out and cut a hole in the middle of the room. And this one's dropping, one like this is dropping down because it's more of an area mic that you can get sound from anywhere. As opposed to the other one that teachers really wanted that I just want me. I don't want the wisecracker in the back of the room showing up in the audio very loud. I mean, you, you can't, you know, it's not like a cone of silence. But it tends to only get here. Yours might be a great example of you probably want one in the middle of the room. Maybe if you're having your, I don't know, if you walk around, I've never been to your class, so I'm always saying how music class works, whether you move a lot or whether you talk from the front and then go to either, I have no idea. So you'd have to let me know what kind of mic uh, you wanted. So you have to have that. You have to, you have to record using your digital whiteboard. That's not 100% true. And when I say that, I mean if I'm it's gonna if I'm just using Smart Recorder, it's gonna record whatever the screen sees, right? That's what's gonna be in the recording. There isn't necessarily gonna be a person unless you want there to be a person. I've got a mic or a camera over there that gets this part of the room. That's all it gets. Doesn't ever get a student in there because both the students and staff said on PD videos they don't want to just see the screen, right? Uh, Dan Clark uses his IPVO camera, the document camera. He has it set up on his desk. And that's what's on the on his screen. He doesn't actually project anything. He's taking it of the room with the sound because he's a very animated. He's walking around teaching foreign language. So he wants him. He wants the students. He wants the sound. All that stuff is part of it. So you can have a camera. I would say most teachers don't want to have a camera. They just want what they're teaching there. So if that's the case, you have to use a digital whiteboard. As a first step, you record. You upload and you post, and we're going to talk about really each of those steps. So recording, oh, I guess I'm going to get to that later. You need a projector, interactive whiteboard, YouTube account, and a microphone. And like I said, if you don't have one, just, just ask. These cost the exact same amount of money. They're like a dime different. So don't feel like, I don't want the big one because it's expensive. Because it's the same cost. It's just that one was the first generation that we used, and they worked really well out of the ceiling. Um, and that one's, like I said, really the same cost, and it gets more of the the room sound. I already said this, you kind of have to use your digital whiteboard if this is what you want. If Mr. Clark writes something on the board from that IPVO, you're not going to know what he wrote. So if you're trying to get what was taught, you really have to use your digital whiteboard to use it. Whether you're using Mimeo or whether you're using Smart doesn't matter as long as you it's projecting on the surface you get it. If you haven't used your before years before, I will I am honest that it takes no more than a week to get totally accustomed to using a digital whiteboard. Lon Swihart next door would kill me if I took his smart board away. And I made him take it. I was like, Lon, I'm going to mount it. In one week, if you want me to take it down, I, I promise I would take it down. 
And at the end of that week, he said, I never want to lose this. Because you get used to it. It saves you so much time. There's no, there's no like I'm doing over here, racing and stuff. You want a clean slate, you hit a button. Uh, if you want to go back and talk about what you talked about last class, you hit the back arrow twice. It's really easy to instruct off of it once you get used to it. Um, and I say that honestly, feel free to ask, ask Lauren. The recording part, everybody's got this smart recorder on their desktop unless you've deleted it. All you have to do is open it. There's only three buttons, a record button, a pause button, a stop button. It automatically saves as soon as you hit stop. So all you have to do is hit record. If you have more than one screen, it'll say which screen you want to record. If you only have one screen, that's it. It just starts recording. If you want to pause in the middle because you're doing a class activity, you can do that. Uh, Jonathan and I were just talking about it. He hates doing that. He just stops and makes a new video. That's that, And I will, I will say probably the only reason he doesn't like doing that is that sometimes when you're recording and you pause and then you restart, the audio is gone on the, after you've paused. I've had that happen. It doesn't happen a lot. I would say about 5% of the time, everything from the pause on, that sound went away. I don't know why that is. Uh, but it's very few. But it, there's, that's what it looks like if you open it up, uh, if you want to do it. And it just saves with the date and time, and you can rename it later up to you. So you you said YouTube. something about switching screens. So, like, if I have multiple things up, because I I do that sometimes. Like, I'll have our warm up on one screen, and then like our lesson on another screen. Like, no, 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 no. I'm just saying. When I say screen, I'm saying like like uh, like I've got two screens. Okay. And like Dan Studebaker's got two. Okay. Uh, some of the teachers have asked for multiple screens. Okay. I thought you meant like multiple. No, no, no. Well, I can I can like, shrink and bring up anything I want to over here. It's recording whatever comes up to this. Okay projection service you just have to make sure if you've got multiple things like Dan does and there's a couple other people okay. that have asked yep. for an additional screen that you pick the right one uploading to YouTube you just drag it uh, there's a button now that looks like a little camera with a plus sign in it to upload it to YouTube you just drag it over there it, it you click on it, it says upload video and then you just drag it in there I I have mine all set to be unlisted as a default and then if I want it to be listed, unlisted just means nobody can find it through a Google search. They have to either be watching it already on my Moodle site or I have to have sent them the link. So I think that's the best thing to do is just have it unlisted. No one needs to be Googling me. I don't, you know, the PD videos, yes, but the classroom videos, absolutely not. I don't want um, my students' voices or anything else to be anywhere other than on my Moodle site if somebody needs to view that. And then my biggest thing is class calendar. I used to do YouTube playlists and all kinds of stuff. Now I just drop it in the calendar and I'm done. My students can find it um, anytime they want to. I will use the videos the following year during activities and lessons and, and quizzes and on pages. But usually I don't do this this year, right? This is I, this year when I recorded, I just put it on the calendar because I just went over it. Why, how would I use it for these things? But next year. I can use it in all kinds of different activities as a blended learning activity. I can use just two minutes of the class intro. Hey, when you come to class, click on this activity. It gives them the beginning of class activities before I talk, start talking about the rest of it or if I'm absent. So you can put a YouTube anywhere in Moodle, anything in Moodle. If you drop the, the URL from YouTube in there, it will turn it into a playable video in, in YouTube, you don't, or I mean in Moodle. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of show you that. So that's the YouTube URL that we're talking about. So it should say youtube.com, watch something. If I copy that and paste it in any block in, in uh, Moodle, it automatically turns it into a video, embedded video. And I do that in my calendar with every single one of my recordings. Once I put them up, I just click on the date. In fact, I should just go and do that. I just click on the date and then and then add it right there into, into Moodle. So if I'm in my hardware class and we went into my hardware class calendar and that's what all these things are pretty much anyway. When I'm in a class, I, I just hit new event and I in the title I put over what we went over, so I might say build a PC. That's it, I make sure the date's right and I go down here to more and I drop that YouTube address in there. I'm just going to grab any YouTube video, whatever com comes up first. Uh, 
Okay, come on, I just want a single video. Where, where do I go? Um, and eh, whatever. I just use this one. So I just grab a video. Okay, so we're gonna learn how. Shh. Drop it right in there, and I got too much on there. It has a whole playlist address. There we go. And when I hit save, <coughs> it just. <coughs> if I go there on the 19th, it automatically embeds the busy and make the player. So. <coughs> Just to have it like end of the day or whatever, yeah. You just get to have it up, yeah. When at end of the day, sometimes plan period, depending on when your plan period is, I usually upload the videos and do it. And when you do that, <clears throat> you don't even have to wait for the video to upload to get that address. If I say I'm going to upload a video, and I'm going to um, just grab a video from my video drive, so when you're recording it in class. Like it's save, like you save it as a video. Yeah, it all just goes to. I made it. I told it to go to this video folder, okay. and then it just saves it with the date okay. and time in there. I just drag it right onto my course, and you can see that it automatically says in this class public in my. This is I'm in not in my class site, um, and it's already got an address right there. So it's still uploading, but it's still got an, already got an address. I can just go over to here already. Get the. It doesn't work, but I can get the address already copy that there we go I can put it in the calendar even while it's still uploading and doing everything my kids are gonna be confused um, and and then it doesn't work when I look at it initially right but it's done as soon as this video says it's done over here um, and I'm gonna exit out because I really don't want I don't know what that video was uh, as soon as it would say it was done this would work then I'm going to delete that. So really, there's kind of, I'm trying to think how many. So you record it, it saves it on your PC, you move it from your PC to YouTube. YouTube. And then YouTube, upload it to your calendar. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm going to delete this other one too because it doesn't belong in there either. Um, so yeah, I, exactly. I, I record it, I upload it, and I post it. And and you can set defaults. And I think, I think that I have slides going through there. Um, yeah, I do. So I should go back to... I'm getting off task, but you can set default so that it's always unlisted. It always says it's education. It always goes to your classroom site kind of thing. And I'll show you how to set that. But th So this is how I do it. And then I use it later for other things uh, in my classroom. And I'll be honest, I really wish I could get... Um, this is a great UDL type thing for kids that are behind in reading. Uh, because my son Luke, he's smart as a whip. He remembers everything that he hears. But sometimes he... You know, it, if if you teach them and then say, okay, everybody do, do go read chapter two, uh, now he's done because he can't read chapter two. But he could he could definitely watch it over last class. So you know, you could say, hey, look, you go do what, watch last class. You know, and he does a review of the previous mm -hmm. class every time, and he by the end of the chapter he knows as well as everybody else. But if the only time he ever got to hear it was that one shot, and then we're done, he may not he may not get that information right. So, when we do our YouTube channel, we want to set up defaults one time. These are some one-time things you have to do. You set up your YouTube channel once and set up a smart board recorder once so that it does those things right. So, um, do I have screen capture that? Okay, so when I set up my YouTube channel, I would recommend having a channel per account. Uh, so, what does that mean? It means if I go to down here and I say, uh, you can see my accounts. I've got one for NT Advanced Tech. I've got a YouTube channel for my hardware class. I've got a YouTube channel for National Trail, for IT stuff. Um, and that's because I don't want them all to be together. It kind of makes it's too many, too much together. And if my students want to find out what we did, if they subscribe to my hardware class, then every time we upload a video, and that was that last thing. Every time I upload a video, they automatically get an email that says, this new video uh, was posted. So I have one that I just did on the retake policy for kids. Um, that shouldn't be on this site. <laughs> that should be on my other one. But the, you can see the other class ones in there as well. So to set up some of those things for defaults, I go to um, my class and I go to uh, Creator Studio to set up my, my defaults. And when I go to that, <clears throat> It's changed so much. It's almost crazy. Um, where's my settings now? G 
channel. I think it's right here. Yeah, there we go. Chan channel upload defaults. And I can go right there, and that's where I can set, okay, I want everything to be unlisted that I put in my hardware class by default. I, I'm going to say it's education by default. My license, standard YouTube license, I have a little description that's in there by default, daily computer hardware A plus class at National Trail High School. Uh, and then I can put a tag on it. I can go through all these settings and say what is important to me. You know, I don't want ads. I don't, so all those ad things are unchecked. Do you want to allow comments? Maybe you don't. I, I, the only people who see it are my students. So I say allow comments all except inappropriate comments, right? But you can say all or you can say none. And if it's none, then I just uncheck that. Nobody can make a comment. I, they can also rate the video whether, you know, nobody ever does that. My students go, don't go right to the video. But they could if they wanted to. So I set those defaults so that I never have to touch any of those things again. I just drag them and I'm done uh, when I upload something to YouTube. Um, and then I have to verify the account. And what does that mean? The first time you upload, if I go, if I go here to upload a video, the first time you upload, right here, it will say, click here to verify your account. An unverified account can only do 15 minutes of video max. To verify your account, you click on it and it'll say, put in your phone number. You put in your cell phone number, it will text you a code, and then you type in the code. And now you can put in videos that are up to 12 hours in length. So that's all it is. It's a one-time thing that you verify that you're not a bot, I guess. I guess that's what it's really verifying. It's not verifying anything else other than the fact that you exist and uh, this isn't something just creating a million accounts or something. Um, so after you've verified that account, then you can do really long ones. I've already said the upload defaults. I always use unlisted. Uh, private, I would never use. No one can see a private video. I guess unless it's a family video that you're like, I'm just saving it here for when Johnny's 52. I don't know what you put it there, but no one can see a private video. And public means anyone can see it, Google it, and find it through YouTube. And I would say a classroom video, uh, like I said, my, my PD videos are public, but none of my classroom videos are public. Um, so that's it as far as, as far as setting up YouTube. The next thing, oh, and I've got, I guess I, have, I had screen captures that. Let's see if there's anything I missed on my screen captures here. Um, I already said that, it's under settings and uh, oh, this is, you don't have to do that anymore. But that's how you can add another channel. If you have to, you all, everybody starts out with one channel that's their name. I don't use my name channel. I don't want a channel named Brian Poole that people are going to, right? So I do, I click on create a new channel and I made one for hardware and I made one. And it used to be you could only have one. Now I don't even know if there's a limit because I haven't hit it and I've got eight. So I would have a different one for steel band than for choir if you were going to do this, for instance. I mean, although you could just have one in THS music if you wanted to or something. You could you could keep them together if you wanted to. Yeah, but then would it be hard to find it? Well, and... and because I'm talking middle school band, so high school it, band. So it, it would be harder, harder for your kid. It would be easier for you to find because you only have to look one place. But it, the same thing is if you had all the videos together, it's harder for your kids if they're looking for something because, you know, they don't, they don't know which one applies to them. Whereas if you have separate channels, they subscribe, you know, they subscribe to this channel and that's it. You know, my hard work kids are in that one. Um, and I have, I have obviously other people than my kids that have subscribed based on those numbers, but... Um, it's people that I've shared stuff with. Jeff Wassum, for instance, is teaching a computer class. He's like, hey, what's your thing? Because he wants to see other things that, that I do and stuff. I had already said this. There's Oh, there's a screen capture. So want to upload videos longer than 50 minutes, increase your limit. That's what you click on to verify. And it just gives you a little thing that you put in your phone number. And then it texts you and you put in the code. And then you're verified and that's it. And I already went through the uh, YouTube defaults. Um, after that, when you upload stuff, the only thing you really have to do is name the video. And I do, I mean, I name the video and hit done, and that's it. <coughs> you can also, if you wanted to, which I really don't do any anymore, but you can set up playlists of all the same subject together if you wanted to, and that's kind of why I put it in 
the calendar because it's easier for the kids to find it that way. The kids were having a really hard time trying to find which one was the right video when it was playlists, but now it's always the new ones on the calendar. It, you know, whereas if they go and search my site, they're going to see all the videos for the last five years. So which one's the right chapter three, you know, kind of thing. So smart recorder. The only thing you have to do is set the video format. Um, I, I test your mic and I'm going to show you what I mean by that and then just do it every every class. So what's that mean? Um, and I, I guess that's a caveat. You will have classes you don't want to share. Everybody has classes that don't go right. You, you just un uploaded it unlisted and if it's like something went wrong and I used to have, I'm going to call him a heckler that sat right here. He sat as close as he could to the mic so that he could basically whisper heckling remarks into the mic when I was teaching. You know? Like, ah! You know, but I still uploaded those videos because if there's five minutes of it that I wanted to do, I could still trim out the re you know the rest of him. Uh, um, and it doesn't mean I have to post it. I, I basically by default did not ever post chapter. Or, I mean, um, round two when he was in the class. I knew that because I knew he said something. But you know what? Then he stopped saying anything because he found out I wouldn't post it anyway. So, um, but you have classes that don't go well, and if they don't go well, you don't you don't post those. That's not a big deal. Um, you will make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. It's the, it, it, This really, um, I've enjoyed doing it um, because of my own experience with my son. Uh, and Mr. Fisher would like to do this because of the experience he had with his daughter, trying to get her school to do the same thing. She's out so much because she's sick. How, how is the student supposed to stay up with the class if they're not in the class? Through no fault of their own. It's not like Luke's skipping. He's at Children's, right? And it's not like his, her daughter's skipping. She's having seizures. So when we have that happen, how do we make sure we're getting, getting the right thing for the kids? So it's not for punitive. It's not so somebody can go and evaluate you. That's one of the things that if that ever came up, I guarantee you that NTA would fight that tooth and nail. That this was an educational thing, not a retributive, ret retributive? Is that the right word? Thing to do. Uh, and it really only takes them into your time. So the smart recorder thing, the first time you open it up, basically you have to go to options. You go down from the menu and go to options, and you want to change the file type. It, it defaults here. This is the devil. And this is good. Okay? And it says, creates a high quality video file there, blah, blah, just believe me. This is the default anyway. It's already recording as an API file, but if you leave it checked here, when you say stop, it spends like 30 minutes to convert it from this to this. Eh, this uploads to YouTube better than this. So you, you have to do that one time for your login to say you want to save it as an ABI file, and then they're saved in, in 15 seconds. The other thing that you're going to want to do is make sure you know where the target file is. That's just two over. Uh, and you, I set mine to my video folder so that I know that where all my videos are going to. It just makes sense. Uh, but wherever you want to put that to, you want to make sure you know where it's saving your videos to so you're not running around looking for your videos. Uh, and honestly, I should probably team, change my temporary file directory as well. But those are the two things that you really need to do. You need to change the, quali the, the format video and where it's going to just so you know where it's going to. So that's all it is. Record, upload, and post. I will tell you there's there's hazards of smart recorder and the only hazard of smart recorder is if you're taking a video of a video sometimes it fails so what does that mean if i'm sitting here and i'm going to open up smart recorder there's smart recorder there it is i open up smart recorder and i hit record and this is where i mean i have to pick which screen because i have two screens um, and I, in the process of recording my class, bring up a video of something what? else. Is the speaker as well? No. Okay. Um, and play a video, and it's not going to do it in the short of it, but sometimes when I stop, instead of doing this, which is what it does, where do you want to save it? It just saves it as the date. See, it says April 19th, 0118. In other words, that's the day and the time that the video was made. Sometimes it fails right there, and that's a bummer. And it only seems to do it when you're doing something um, that has a video in it. And I just said no, and it 
It's like if you pull up a video from online that sometimes it would. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Or, or it's happened to me when I put up a secondary camera. Like if I try to catch the IPVO in a recording, of a recording, it fails then. Which is why I moved to OBS Studio, which is what I'm using right now. OBS Studio is a little more advanced in the setup. And I would say that if you got to the point where you're recording every class and you're like, you know what, it's happened two or three times, I'd like to switch to a different method, then I'll show you that one. It's just a little more complex. Uh, it allows you to stream live on YouTube. It allows you to do multiple cameras like that. OBS Studio, that's a camera, that's a camera, that's a camera. And I can just hit my hotkeys. So when I have a computer set up here, I can hit hotkey and now it's recording from there down to here. So my students can see what we did. Because a lot of time in my class is hands on and it used to be it would just record what's on the, here on the screen. Oh no, they got nothing. You know, if, if I do a 80 minute recording and all you see is this while I'm walking around doing something else, it's kind of lost, right? Which is why I have it hooked up to the other, other cameras as well. But it, it is, it's really, more than anything else, it's a, it's a uh, change of, of kind of flow for your day. But once you've done it for a couple weeks, it, it's nothing. I mean, this takes no time. All I hit is do is hit record and stop. I'm, that's it. Uh, to upload, you're talking about one minute of your time and then posting it somewhere in Moodle. The calendar I just find is the easiest place to put it. Uh, and you gotta tell people it's there, right? If you just start posting your calendar and nobody knows it's there, no one's gonna ever see it either, right? So, um, but it does become a thing when my kids come in and go, hey, I missed last Friday, what do we do? I don't know, why don't you go sit over there and find out what we did? And they'll come and sit down right there during intervention and watch the class with headphones on. Um, and likewise, if a kid shows up on, on, for instance, this coming Monday and says, I didn't know we had a test, that was your responsibility to make up the class before now. First of all, the test is on Moodle. Second of all, the class was on Moodle. You had the last four days to, to make, you know, find out what we did. So anyway, is there any questions? So I'm just trying to think how and what would be beneficial? Am I being recorded? Yeah. No, never mind. Well, I can pause it. Hold on. All. Do, do, do.